Well, thank you so much, Sane, for inviting me. It's a treat to be here, and thank you to the audience, virtual and real life, for listening to me. So I'm a musicologist. I work in theology for many reasons. <laughs> I work now at the Center for Privacy Study, which uh, is a center of excellence where we study issues of early modern privacy. So we, we try to study what is privacy, both as a threat and a quality. And as part of uh, the center, I work on my project, um, which is called Sound, Soundscapes of Rosenborg, which is what I'm going to present today. So my project um, is about reconstructing the sound of the past. The question I'm going to address today is, can we listen to the past with our modern ears? And how do we reconstruct? What are the challenges? What are the methods we can use to reconstruct a history, a sonic history of the past? I work on Rosenborg Castle for several reasons. So uh, Rosenborg is a unique case because it's extremely well preserved. I'm going to contradict myself in one minute, but it's uh, uh, if you think, for instance, of Versailles or Sans Souci, it's uh, courts and castles that have been extensively renovated. You have some rooms that are still from the 17th century, but most of them are not. And Rosenborg is um, in this situation that it's extremely well preserved from the 17th century because it has been abandoned. In 1710, it was too small. It's a small castle. So that's also part of uh, one interesting thing for me. I'm going to go back to that in a minute. Um, the other thing is uh, Rosenborg Castle has a treasury which contains a lot of objects that makes noise or not, silent or noisy object. And I work on this on these artifacts. Um, the final thing is because it's preserved as it is, we can actually listen not just to the artifact, but we can also listen to the, to the space. If you go into the winter room, you actually hear it as Christian IV would have heard it. Huh? Now, to contradict myself, <laughs> I said it's extremely well preserved, but it went through a lot of uh, evolution during the, um, the 17th century. Christian IV took it as a teeny tiny uh, lustrous, the first drawing on the top. And he liked Rosenborg very much, and he loved architecture and music, his favorite uh, art form. And he kept extending it. So that's the evolution from uh, his time, from 1605, when he, when he settled there. It's a temporary residence. Maybe I should specify that. Um, <coughs> the early modern court, they would never live for long in one castle. So there was Copenhagen Castle, not the one we have today, another one that disappeared. There was Rosenborg. And then, because of the Danish monarchical system, he had to travel around for ju um, justice and tax purposes. So they would move around all the time. But uh, he was particularly fond of Rosenborg and added a lot of extension. You can see here he added an extra floor, then he added two turrets, then more turrets. So it, it was getting bigger and bigger. And over the next uh, three kings, there were other additions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the maps because I would like to talk about sound, but I'm just showing you uh, some changes were made. So when I work on this project, I try to find a room and I have to understand what stage of the building and the renovation it represents. Um, so it actually grew from this tiny lustrous to a uh, uh, Renaissance palace. Huh? And it was a place of pleasure in the first time, lustrous, and it became a collector's palace. They would bring, at some point, the treasury started, not like it is today, but they would bring a lot of precious objects uh, in Rosenborg. I said I like Rosenborg because it's small, and that's one reason that uh, that's one of the reasons I chose this castle. It's always been a more private palace, so that's a good place to study privacy and sound. Maybe I should precise that um, I do work on privacy and sound because 
For a start, uh, historians, they rarely listen. They, never, they use maps, they use archives, but they don't really listen. Um, musicologists, they do listen, but mostly to music. And sound study people listen mostly to contemporary things. So what I do in this project is that I bring the three of them together. And um, uh, what I use is, um, so when sometimes when I present this project to historians, some of them are very puzzled and they are like, but you cannot listen to the past, it's not there. Right, but I'm a musicologist and I've been working on musicology, early modern music all my life. And we all have heard early music we can listen to the past. My project is not naive in the sense I'm not trying to reconstruct a period here. We have different here. No, not. <laughs> they work in a different way because the first image I show on my title place was how they conceived the year in the 17th century. But it's for musicologists, it's totally normal to reconstruct uh, sounds from the past except these sounds are mostly music, as I said. What I do now is I adopt its um, method called uh, historically informed practices, when you first you get to use the early modern instrument. A uh, gut string instead of a uh, metal string for the violin, you use a special bow and it sounds different and some people found it horrible and you use the harpsichord instead of the piano or the pianoforte, the one from Beethoven and people think, ah, oh, that sounds like a pan, but it's actually how it sounded. And so our ears are um, modeled by habits. So if you used to listen to early music on a harpsichord, you found it wonderful and the music is completely different. If you've played the piano when you were a little kid, you probably played Bach on the piano and when you hear, hear it for the first time on a harps harpsichord, it's kind of strange. But that's what we do when we do um, early, early modern, uh, historically uh, informed practice. We reconstruct the sound from the past and we work with text musical score, but also music pedagogy to understand how people were trained in music, uh, all kinds of sources. Huh? Uh, painting, where you can see the musician, how they hold their bow, how they hold their gambas, and uh, all kinds of sources. So you have to be a bit creative, but this is something that is totally normal for musicology, a bit less for historian. So what I'm doing is in my project is I combine uh, methods from the three fields I've just mentioned, musicology, history, and sound studies. Um, why do I do that? Is because I argue that sounds bring a change of paradigm. If you start listening to the spaces of the past, you hear different things and you also see different things. First time I gave a presentation on soundscape uh, in the uh, Parterre of Historian and the Center for Privacy Studies, I said, look, you look at maps like this. So we like to discuss the notion of threshold in, uh, in the Center for Privacy Studies because it's where you come from the public to the private. When you look at a map, the threshold is the door, so it would be here. But if you put sound in that, it gives a completely different uh, um, understanding of privacy. You can hear a private quarrel that has been conducted inside in the private space. You can hear it outside. Uh, the other way around, you can hear a music performance, a serenade being played outside. You can hear it inside and maybe you don't like it. Uh, they are since a long time they have been complaining about noise. Noise is uh, always, um, I'll come back to that in my conclusion, sorry. Um, you can hear the noise of the blacksmiths, uh, but this is a, a good noise. It's the noise of work, but drunk people, bad noise. So there is, um, when I work with sound and I bring it to the, the, private, um, the privacy aspect, the threshold gets extended, no? there is this porosity. So it's not a clear cut inside, outside, private, public. And that's actually interesting because privacy functions just the same way. And I will argue later that sound and noise do the same. Huh? Okay, so uh, sound gives this change of paradigm. You start 
hearing things, not <laughs> uh, by an hallucination, but uh, you, you look at your sources and you start to hear them. Huh? Um, it's also interesting because I think it brings back people in the equation. Usually we look at maps, we look at sources. <coughs> if you populated your castle or any kind of uh, space you would like to study with sounds, uh, you bring back people in it. It's a, it's a project that is about materiality, ab about rhythm, about motions and about bodies. It's also giving um <coughs> a discussion about uh, the community. We all hear the same soundscape and same thing in the past. Uh, or it, It's called an oral community. We are used to have the bell of that church, the train and the planes today flying. Um, we all hear them. Some people appreciate them, some people hate them. It's a question of perception. So the, the, the soundscape is shared. It creates a shared orality, but you can also interpret it in different ways, according to where you're from, culturally, socially, or all kinds of um, aspects. So I like to, uh, in my project, because when I see, when I say I work on a castle, people think, oh, the king, his wife, and the little princess. No, I want to study everything that makes noise or music, or is silent uh, in the castle. It includes um, all the servants that are often also kind of removed from uh, the history, but also animals or objects. Music instrument is an obvious place to start, but all kinds of objects like an astronomical o clock or an automaton or uh, weapons or carriage or all of this. So. And one, um, one thing I wanted to add is that um, you can close your eyes. You cannot close your ear. You, you can with an external aid, but we don't have uh, ear lids. So sound, as I said before, it crosses the threshold of the house, but it crosses also literally the threshold of your body. It's resonating inside you. Um, so, let me show you some example. Just checking the time, we're doing fine. Um, I want to start with uh, Queen Sophia Amalia. That's a very famous painting of, um, of the, the, the Queen. And um, not many people have noticed uh, the... Why do I start with that? Sorry. Uh, it's because I also study gender and colonial aspect in my project. So that's the perfect <laughs> one of the, well, a lot is about that. I'm, I'm asking the question, do female or slave or servants or different social class have different soundscape? I take this picture uh, as an example because I, I think it's, it's a fabulous case. Um, you can see that everything is black and white. We have some red in the background of the painting and the little slave boy has a yellowish um, uh, dress. But apart from that, uh, the three protagonists, because they are three, is uh, the Gear Falcon. It's an Icelandic falcon. He's all white. He's from Iceland and Iceland was a colony of Denmark. And the black boy, he's so black that we cannot really see him, no? We, we discern it, but it's a, it's a slave boy. Uh, he's really black. And uh, the queen has this amazing dress, which is all black and white. Huh? So this is a perfect, for me, a perfect painting of um, um, domination, both from the humans and the non-humans, huh? animal. And she exhibit them both as kind of tokens of her dominion on the colonies, north and south, black and white. Um, so this is a very female um, representation, of uh, female of course, feminine I meant, <laughs> representation of Sophia Malia. She was also well known as a as an avid huntress, and hunt is another soundscape I like to study because um, I <laughs> this is not my favorite music. <laughs> But 
Um, I think Hunt has one of the most interesting soundscapes. Um, it's about um, a sonic kill. Huh? What you just heard was the beginning of the Halali. It's the uh, par force hunt was the favorite form of hunt. Huh? Uh, it was introduced by Louis XIV and the Danes introduced it, Christian V introduced it to the Denmark. Uh, Duhaven, if you know it, it's a uh, the Hermitage Castle is there, it's a hunting lodge, and that's the ground where they would uh, hunt uh, with this type of hunt. Uh, Sofia Mali would do all kinds of hunt. She's famous for having killed one day, in one day, 30 deer, when this big red Danish deer, so she not only loved it, she apparently was good at it. Huh? Um, so, but I'm, I want to talk about par force hunt because it's the one that is, it's literally a sounded hunt. So you have uh, the dogs, you have the horse. It's one of the cruelest hunt uh, that you perform. Huh? You would uh, run after the deer until it's exhausted. You would isolate one deer, make it run until it's completely exhausted, and then kill. It. And it's not just that. But uh, the sound in this kind of hunt is really interesting because you have a whole troop of this uh, French horn as they are called, because they were invented uh, for this kind of hunt. And, and they would sound um, like a premonition of what's going to happen. The animal is going to be killed. So they have a, a series of tunes that they perform. They still do it, uh, the, not the powerful hunt. It's prohibited, but the, the horn uh, um, music. Um, and then uh, during the it's a very ceremonial hunt. Everything is planned. It, it must go. It must follow a certain course. So during the hunt, uh, they would play different things so that the different uh, hunter can know at what stage we are because these woods were big and so they couldn't see each other. So it, it works with signal. Huh? And it's interesting because everything that has to do with interspecies communication, it often works with a non-verbal signal. So in this case, it's music, but it could also be a whistle if you want to recall your, your dog. So you have a whole kind of ritualistic component, which is mostly sonic in this form of hunt. And at the end, what you heard is when the animal is going to be killed. So you hear the kill before you actually perform it. And it would be the king or the highest ranking, not her because she's a woman, the highest ranking um, uh, aristocrat who would kill the, the deer with a special um, spear called the Hirschfanger. And when the, um, it's not over, sorry, <laughs> when the animal is killed, uh, you would give it to the dogs. So it's called the, la curée. The dog would destroy it, literally. And uh, that's their re uh, rewarding for the hunt. And after that, you go back to the hunting lodge and the musician would play the whole tune as like a, a remembrance of what was going on during the hit. So it's, it's a court ceremonial. Everything is prescribed. Everything is following a certain order and everything is sounded. So that's why I wanted to uh, take a brief example uh, with the hunt. Then I also work, as I said, with male, female, but also children um, soundscape because you have different sound of voices. And uh, I take, as I said, uh, into account all kinds of social classes. Huh? Um, and I thought of bringing the children in because they are uh, like, sorry, my sound bites are a bit long. Yeah. <coughs> um, Rosenborg was the place where Christian IV was with his wife number two, morganatic wife number two, uh, Kirsten Munch. Uh, he had a lot of children. He had uh, at least four mistresses, 23 children and one morganatic marriage. Morganatic marriage, do I need to explain? You know, okay. Um, so, and actually uh, all the Danish kings during this period uh, had a lot of legitimate and illegitimate uh, children. 
bastards on bastard, um, uh, uh, mistresses and uh, illegitimate children. And I, I want to uh, work on that because this brings an insight into what is uh, the, the, the illegitimate rel relationship and how does this translate into uh, the prominency, but also the, the, the sound of these people. They are silence in history, so we bring them back. They were not that silence at the time, but not so much today. Eh? We tend to consider the king and the queen and their legitimate children. So, another, uh, so my sources, as I said, are uh, written sources. No, I didn't say it, so I better say it. Uh, <laughs> first of all, yes, as a historian, written sources. Uh, so I use uh, the inventory of the castle. Uh, I use description. I use traveler accounts because it's usually when you're not from the place that you notice things that are interesting, not just in sound, but also in sound. So the traveler accounts, I will give an example shortly, um, visiting Rosenborg are often where you find the most information. Uh, this is classic. You would um, traveler accounts, they notice things that as I said before, people have a shared orality. So if it's what you hear every day, you don't notice it. If you come from abroad, suddenly you notice different sound and maybe you're going to write that in your diary. And you often do. And I read all these sources with a thesaurus of uh, uh, words that relate to sound or speaking or silence or I'm not going to give you the list, otherwise <laughs> it's going to be boring. Huh? And then uh, visual sources, so paintings, but also artifacts. Let me show you some of the paintings. So in the winter room, to which I shall come back, we have 75 wall painting uh, that depicted everyday life at Rosenborg Castle. And uh, you have hunt scene, you have um, uh, skating scenes, you have uh, this kind of scene. And in most of them, you can actually read sounds if you want. You can see that here you have uh, some comedians, um, there is a kid, there are animals, and all of these uh, human and non-humans produce sound. So that's one of my sources. I go through all the painting and I try to read them by the sound they, they produce. Huh? Another one are the artifacts. So this is a tiny, teeny carriage from the ivory collection. As I said, uh, animals were present at court. I, I started with the, the falcon, but there were a lot of animals, either as workforce, like horses, who were also military power, um, animals for food, animals for entertainment, for birds, uh, exotic birds, or all, all kinds of animals. And uh, since I'm in the talking about ivory, I have to address the elephant in the room. Sorry, it's a really bad joke, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Rosenborg has one of the biggest um, ivory collection in the world. It's a gorgeous object. Ivory turning was an extremely complicated process. Um, you had to be really good at geography, uh, geometry, sorry, at measurement, and it, um, well, I'm not good. It's complicated. Uh, the, the, the result is this extremely finely carved figure that are completely fragile and they are absolutely beautiful. Problem is, they come from elephant tusk and elephant tusk are connected with um, slave trade. Huh? So the slave were called the black ivory and the, t the tusk the was called white gold and they are completely intertwined because usually when uh, it was the, the slave that were carrying the tusk until the boat and then they, they were not yet enslaved, they, were so they would sell everything together, people, tusk and everything. Um, so um, in this case, I think that's interesting because the animal has been completely silenced, it's dead. So it's one of my artifacts that do not make noise anymore. Well. Not true, because we have a few ivory pieces that make sounds. A flute, a whip, and I think the whip is interesting because it's actually a, um, an instrument of domination, another one, but it's a dead animal turned again into a sound-producing object. Huh? 
Um, so, um, this is a, a glass cabinet. I should bring you to Rosenborg. <laughs> it's difficult to explain the space. This is a teeny tiny place. Huh? And uh, uh, it's full of this glass object. Another very fragile, like the ivory collection, very fragile place. But it's also a, remi a reminder of everything that was going on in the castle. So this glass cabinet is a tiny place on the last floor where you have the big reader uh, hall. And that's where they would hold banquets. So I also work on food and the noise it produces, the smelly, ugly noise produced down in the kitchen that were in the basement, and then the magnificent spectacle of food being brought to the table, carved on the spot and served to the guest with a lot of uh, banquets are also an interesting uh, soundscape like uh, um, uh, hunting, uh, a different form of it. They are connected, <laughs> uh, but it's also uh, very interesting because you have, usually you have musicians, uh, there used to be a tribune in this room and they would put musicians and then you have all the noise produced by the guests, the servants bringing the food, the cooks, hidden in the kitchen, but also uh, there was one special um, uh, food carver, it's called. He would perform in front of the guests huh, to cut the meat. Banquets, and then we have outside noise. I mentioned um, the hunt before, but uh, uh, the garden of Rosenborg were all are also an interesting place, both for privacy and for um, sound. Um, you have the natural sound, um, wind, water, and you have uh, the animal sounds again, mostly birds huh, in the garden, but also dogs um, and probably cats. They don't get depicted that much. Um, so I was mentioning before that Rosenborg was a private place, sort of. As we have learned, nothing is really private and nothing is really public. It's a porous uh, distinction. Um, but the garden was not open to the public in the 17th century. Uh, they were, they built big walls and this is interesting, so they hide it from sight, but you cannot hide it from the sound. No? So you would hear the people from outside, but they, they cannot look inside, but they can hear, so it goes both ways again. No? Um, they, they manage to avoid the glimpses, uh, but not the sound. And Frederick V opened some part of the garden to the visitor on the condition that they were neatly dressed. He wanted only ordinary men's girl in his garden. So that was, I read this ordinary as people who behave also sonically. They wouldn't shout and yell. And here it is, sailors came in, they were drunk and they were noisy. <coughs> so it was closed again. So they were probably dressed, they had their uniform but they made a sonic mess. So that's the reason why the garden was closed again. Now, I would come to, oh, here are my birds, finally. Well, and le then a, a later uh, depiction, but I would go back to the winter room because this is another reason why I chose Rosenborg. Uh, Rosenborg has a fantastic sonic trick. It's uh, called invisible music. So uh, these are the panels I mentioned before. I show one of them. But the magic trick is on the floor. We have four vents. So Christian IV built them. He opened the floor in the fourth angle and put his musician in the basement. And they would play from down there. And people would hear uh, the music without seeing the musician. We are so used to it. That's how we listen to most of the music today. The, the dissociation of the source and uh, the sound is normal for us. But at the time, this was creating amazement and stupefaction. That's exactly what Christian IV would have. So I love this example because it's where we can start to recreate a listening practices. Well, they did invisible music, what is this? It's, we have it all the time. And why is it so, so, so surprising? So uh, this is just a brief description, sorry, my 
Charles Augier, uh, he did a visit with the French ambassador in 1634 and say, with sudden delight, we experienced with amazement as the source, as the sound reached our ear through various vents, as though they were sometimes closer, sometimes more distant, that subterranean, invisible, but not unpleasant music. She seems to be a bit surprised that it's not ugly because there is this kind of cut between the source and the, the, the production, uh, the, the result. So this is fantastic for me because um, he, you can locate it. We, we did an experiment at Rosenborg. Uh, you, you locate immediately where the sounds come from. That's what our ears do. No? We, you realize where it comes from. But he said something else. Uh, sometimes closer, sometimes more distant. And I interpret that, uh, that the king would have his, his visitor walking around so they can or the musician downstairs. I don't know, it could bo go both ways. But it's really an interesting phenomenon. I, it's a kind of a, a heavy technology to make um, loudspeakers, right? Uh, well, sure, you need a castle. You need to dig holes in your basement, and you need to pay the musician and put them to play in the, in the cellar. But we have several of these. This one is the more detailed one. That's why you, we have four maybe five, four uh, at least, description, and everybody mentioned this amazing trick that the music is invisible. So I think I'm almost, I would like to say something about the noise, silence and noise, yes. Um, so silence and noise are something that are very hard to define, just like privacy. There is no hard definition, huh? uh, because you can consider them from various point of view. It's a, it's, it's a question of perception. So it's for acoustician, it's super easy. They say, all right, everything above 85 decibel is going to hurt you here. Everything below 20 decibel is silence in purely acoustical terms. But 20 decibel can be really loud depending on the context. If you have somebody snoring besides you, uh, it can be a light snore, but I think you would call it noise in that case. No, it's something that disturbs you. So I don't have a good definition of noise. Don't ask me for one, but the, the best one I found, not me, I, I read, uh, is that it's sound out of place, like, inspired by Mary Douglas that was saying um, matter, um, dirt is matter out of place. So, so noise is sound out of place. So what does it mean? Um, I think <coughs> sound, noise and silence can both be um, positive or negative. Oh, I, I took the example of the, the, um, the ivory collection. Animals have been silenced, they have been dominated. You can use silence as a torture. You can also use noise as a, as a, um, a weapon of torture. Uh, so they can be, really both of them can be uh, considered in, in, in various uh, aspects. Um, but um, noise traditionally has been associated with the unmusical, the unintentional and something that is disruptive. Huh? But it's again a question of perception and um, judgment. It's, it's a judgment as well, we'd say. Uh, for instance, what is music? What is noise? Depends. Some people consider uh, some music as noise. I just give you an example that is completely unrelated, but it's one I, I really like. For instance, in 19th century uh, Victorian Brit Britain, they would complain about the noise produced by this dirty, loud, noisy Italian migrant playing the organ barrel. The thing is, what they did play on this organ barrel was Verdi, which I guess even a British Victorian would consider as musical. So according to the context, again, music can become noise, but in this case, it's, it's really a, a racial uh, evaluation. It's because of the people playing the music, not so much because of the sound. Huh? So um, 
noise always imply a form of uh, judgment. And it's actually um, another source I didn't mention, then I will conclude. Um, it's actually interesting that uh, I look a lot at uh, regulation huh? um, of the city of Copenhagen in the 18th century. So they regulate always about order. Huh? It's uh, the good order of the city. So what can be disruptive of this good order? Noise is a recurrent thing and it's they have been noise complained, the first one from the Roman Empire. Huh? Um, so you have, as I said before, you have the productive noise. So you cannot really silence a carpenter or a blacksmith, which could be very noisy, but it's a productive sound. So that's not disrupting the order. But you make special regulation. For instance, in Altona, which was part of the uh, Danish um, uh, Empire, uh, they would prohibit to the blacksmiths to work close to a professor house because the professor, that would be nice if we don't have this. <laughs> the professor needs to concentrate, so he needs silence. Huh? So again, in this case, noise is evaluated that, okay, we have to endure it because it's a productive noise, but not close to the professor house. And so other regulations, and the last thing I'm gonna say, um, Silence and noise are also time specific. Huh? Uh, silence is usually associated with the noise and daily activity can be a bit noisier. Huh? Um, noise is especially a disruption if it happens at night. Drunken sailor were not good uh, during daytime in the park, but drunken sailor at night, that's really disrupting the, the, the order. Dogs, um, uh, wild dogs, enraged dog would be regularly killed by it. that was the duty of the poli one of the duty of the police because they were noisy yeah? and they were threatening also uh, um, health um, so as i said the, they are linked to times time specific um, activity but also uh, with space. Silence is often associated with a variety of natural space, uh, like the desert, the wood, the garden, whereas noise is mostly associated with the city. But if you look a bit better, the, the countryside can be also very noisy. I found complaints of the farmer working, but okay, they are working, but they sing and they don't know how to sing in tune. Also another complaint, not a legal complaint from the police, but uh, uh, so again, you can turn it round and round, but what, what I'm, I'm not trying, this is exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to do. I, I'm not trying to, to define this thing. I'm trying to understand how people use the concept because so I can understand how they did listen and what was disrupting them, huh? what they would consider as noise and what not. And that's it. I want to thank you for listening and it's a pleasure. <laughs>